Good morning again. Welcome to our Sunday morning online worship service. Uh, glad you're able to join us today. Have a few things we want to go over, and, and uh, many of you have already seen the email. And uh, we've also mailed out uh, letters uh, to folks that don't uh, utilize email uh, regarding our, our upcoming services. On uh, We're going to start uh, worshiping together for those that are comfortable uh, and, and uh, want to do so. We're going to start worshiping collectively at the Sunrise Ranch in South Fayetteville. Uh, this this is the ranch that is uh, managed by uh, Chad and Pat Van Lanningham, so that's where they live actually out there. And they've got an arena that uh, uh, their uh, owner of the property has, has uh, graciously uh, allowed us to use. And so a couple of things that uh, need to make sure we understand is that, uh, as was mentioned in the letter, the letters that went out, uh, uh, the arena has a dirt floor. And it's not just a regular old flat uh, dirt. It's 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 pretty significant uh, in depth and and pretty soft. And so the reason we're we're telling folks that is so that you will uh, uh, wear appropriate shoes and and attire. Uh, you probably don't want to wear uh, uh, nice uh, high heels or, or uh, nice shoes that you, that you wouldn't want to get dirty. So uh, please uh, think about that as you're preparing for worship. And uh, as, as is mentioned in the letter about the, as far as the uh, parking, uh, we'll have attendance there for uh, uh, helping you uh, know where to park. If you are a, uh, have a little bit of trouble, uh, or if you're a high risk, I should say, if you're a high risk uh, individual or uh, uh, have trouble walking, uh, you'll be allowed to park right up beside the arena. So it should be not any further of a walk than what you would walk if you were uh, at our building at Center Street. Uh, and so, uh, and then we're asking, we're going to ask, of course, the, the younger folks to park, uh, a little bit further away. The furthest you'll have to walk would be like, a, it's like three tenths of a mile. And so it's, it's not a very long walk at all. Just want everybody to, to understand that. And, and, uh, please try to be on time, uh, because of the, uh, we need to, we need to be respectful of, of, uh, the owner of the ranch, property owner. Let's, let's, uh, get in and have our worship and, and, uh, uh then get, get cleared out of there, uh, you know, you know, as quick as we can. Uh, so uh, we're asking that you probably need to arrive uh, no later than than uh, nine fifteen in order to uh, in case you need to to, to make that walk. And so uh, so anyway, uh, that's that's the situation, and we're so looking forward to seeing all of you. Uh, and now at this time, uh, I want to I want to uh, encourage all of us to uh, uh, be ready to worship, uh, and uh, as we uh, enter our service together. Sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer, that calls me from a world of care, and gives me at my Father's throne, makes all my wants and wishes known. In seasons of distress and grief, my soul The prophet Micah did his work during the reigns of Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. He wrote during the time of the divided kingdom 
with Israel in the north and Judah in the south. Micah predicted that the Assyrians would come and carry off Israel, the northern kingdom, into captivity in 722 BC, never to be heard from again. The Assyrians would also war against Judah, but Jerusalem would not be destroyed yet. That destruction at the hands of a later empire, Babylon, would occur in 605 BC. But why did all this happen? The short answer is a failure on the part of God's people to bring glory to God. This is more than just praising God. It is living lives which bring Him glory. In this, the nation had failed miserably. In Micah 3, 8, the prophet said, I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, and with justice and courage to make known to Jacob his rebellious act even to Israel his sin. The prophet pictures God coming forth from his place and walking on the mountains with images of fire and smoke. Sound familiar? It should. It brings to mind images of God on Mount Sinai. But this time, he is coming not to establish a covenant, but to proclaim judgment. This language paints an ominous picture, but it is one for which Israel has supplied the darkest of brushstrokes. Micah's accusation against the leaders of the nation is that they have become guilty through theft and greed. He compares it to King Ahab stealing Naboth's vineyard. The nation's prophets are also targeted by Micah. They're glad to offer the protection of, to God, to people, if the people are able to pay them off. It's so reminiscent of the story of Balaam that Micah mentions him in the verses we're going to study. Micah further considered the sins of the nation's leaders in chapters 3 and 4. They ran the country ruthlessly. They took advantage of the poor so that they, the so-called leaders, might gain the favor of the rich. It was abuse of position for personal gain they were in direct violation of the law of Moses in this regard. In the text for our lesson, God set the scene of a legal proceeding. It's a civil suit. Jehovah God is the plaintiff in this cosmic court. Let's read the transcript, beginning in Micah chapter 6, verse 1. Hear now what the Lord is saying. Arise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Listen, you mountains, to the indictment of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth, because the Lord has a case against his people. Even with Israel, he will dispute. My people, what have I done to you? And how have I wearied you? Answer me. Indeed, I brought you up from the land of Egypt and ransomed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. With what shall I come to the Lord and bow myself before the God on high? Shall I come to him with burnt offerings, with yearling calves? Does the Lord take delight in thousands of rams and ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God? In his case, Jehovah versus the people of Israel, the Lord first calls the mountains as witnesses, they're unchanging. They've been watching for all of Israel's history. They were witnesses at Mount Sinai and the mountains of cursing and blessing in Deuteronomy 27. God begins by asking, My people, what have I done to you? And how have I wearied you? Answer me. Then he sets them straight what he has done. He brought them up from the land of Egypt. He ransomed them from slavery, and he sent them Moses, Aaron, and Miriam to lead them. 
God is saying, here is the history. Here is what happened. You have ignored it at your peril. At this point, Micah presents a reply for the people, and it is an insolent, selfish, ugly reply to the God who loves them. Essentially, it is, what do you want from us? You want burnt offerings? You want yearling calves? Would you accept thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of oil? Now they're getting sarcastic with the God of all creation. And finally, shall I present my firstborn for my rebellious acts, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Micah then speaks on the Lord's behalf in simple words, sure to wipe the smirks off their faces. Let's take a brief look at what Micah says, and that will be our lesson. In verse 8 of our text, Micah wrote, He has told you, O man, what is good. The legendary commentators and linguists, Kyle and Delich, point out that he has told you should be translated, they have told you, or you have been told. I point this detail out because Micah was saying that what he's about to tell them was not something new. It is something which his listeners and readers should have already known from a study of the Torah, the Old Testament books of law. In families, this is an often used technique when a parent has to confront a son or daughter concerning some infraction against the rules of the family. When I was a boy, I invented a game where I hit a tennis ball with my hand against our garage door. This was a game I played, sadly, by myself. I was not a very popular child. My dad told me that eventually I was going to break one of the little windows on the top of the garage door if I kept playing that way. I thought, that's silly. It's just a tennis ball and I'm hitting it with my hand. Further, I reasoned that since my daddy's day job was cutting glass in a window glass factory, how hard could it be for him to fix the window in the highly unlikely event that I broke it? Well, as I'm sure you've already guessed, one of the panes of glass shattered, and the first words out of daddy's mouth, somewhat disappointed, were, weren't you already told that if you kept hitting the door with the tennis ball, you would eventually break one of those windows? So the Israelites had already been told what Micah was going to tell them. If they'd listened at first, they would not have ended up with a broken country. But they didn't listen. So Micah summed up what is good, what God required, in three statements. First, he said they needed to do justice. In Micah 2.1, this indictment of those who did not do justice appears. Woe to those who scheme iniquity, who work out evil on their beds. When morning comes, they do it, for it is in the power of their hands. Micah went on to say that such men had, against the law of Moses, defrauded people of the land, which was their family inheritance. Notice that they schemed iniquity. They planned it out. They worked out evil on their beds. Their last thought of the day was how to take advantage of others. And then their first action of the day was to take the simple action they planned the night before. Why? For it is in the power of their hands. In other words, their worldview did not involve justice, but firmly held to the ungodly principle that might makes right. We have a responsibility to do justice, to be fair. It's what God requires, and he has defined it as good. Second, Micah said they were required to love kindness. The Hebrew word used here is found 239 times in the Old Testament. It's usually translated loving kindness, 
and it is very closely associated with God. So much so, in fact, that Jonah cited this attribute of God as the reason he at first refused to go preach to the people of Nineveh. He was afraid those people he hated would change their ways and that God would forgive them as a result of his kindness. It is important that we love kindness. It is enough of a priority for us to love kindness enough that we will choose it over the alternatives. Will we be the Good Samaritan or will we be the priest and the Levite who pass by on the other side of the road? To love kindness is what God requires and he has defined it as good. Third, Micah told the Israelites to walk humbly with God Continually in the Bible, the inspired writers use this metaphor of life as a walk, as a journey. And what kind of walk are we to walk? One of humility. Several years ago, Bill Swanson, the CEO of Raytheon, wrote down 33 short observations on leadership. Of the 33, there was only one rule that he said never fails. A person who is nice to you but rude to the waiter or to others is not a nice person. Nobody knows who came up with that idea, but Mr. Swanson helped to popularize it. CEOs and others involved in human resources have been watching prospective employees with this principle in mind for years since. Dell Jones of USA Today wrote that the consensus is that how others treat wait staff is like a magical window into the soul. The God of the universe agrees those insolent, arrogant people of Israel who asked, what do you want from us? were immediately reminded what had been done by God for their benefit. When we are arrogant, we exchange commandment for culture. When I choose to live my way rather than to submit to a kind and loving creator, I make myself and my desires the standard. An arrogant person stomps and yells and demands and accuses and takes and intimidates. We must get this right and wipe arrogance out of our lives and replace it with a humble walk with God. It is what God requires and he has defined it as good. God wants us to glorify him. We're not going to accomplish that desire through a particular worship style or by accommodating culture. We can only glorify God when we do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with our God.
you'd like to follow along, I'm going to be reading from John chapter 6, verses 53 through 58 to help prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper. And it says, Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we're thankful for this day and for your many blessings and we're thankful that we have this opportunity to protect this bread which represents your son's body that was hung on the cross and Lord help us to remember the life that he lived, uh, the example that he set for us, but also Father help us to remember the resurrection and the hope that it gives us, the hope for eternal life and we're so thankful for that Father, and we just ask that we try to give that hope to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you bow with me? Dear Father in heaven, Lord, um, we come to you now, Lord, as we prepare to take this cup. Lord, I pray that you would be with each and every one of us. Um, help us to focus our minds. Help us to focus our hearts on you, Lord, but also help us to focus on um, the sacrifice that was made for us, Lord, the blood that was shed for us, um, so that we may have that hope to spend eternity with you. Lord, I pray that we would take this in a manner that would be pleasing unto you, and I just pray that we would not that we would remember not only today, uh, but remember every single day the sacrifice uh, that Jesus made for us. I pray all things in Jesus' name. Amen. this morning and right now we'll close us out with a word of prayer dear heavenly father we just want to thank you so much for this day and just 
every day and all the many blessings that you give us. And Lord, uh, please help us right now just to look to you for, for strength and guidance and wisdom and help us to remember that, that you are still in control no matter how crazy things may seem. Lord, we ask you just please continue to be with our country right now with the, all the chaos that's going on. You please, we ask you just please help us in, in ways that only you can. Lord, as we're hoping to meet together again soon, we ask you uh, please help everything to go well and smoothly and that, that everyone stays healthy. And we thank you so much for everything you've given us. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.